Welcome to another episode of Experience Focused Leaders. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to Gail Terry, who is the CMO and President of Domestic and General's U.S. business. Uh, uh, Domestic and General is one of the leading appliance care providers worldwide with over 100 year long history and over 3000 employees. Welcome to the pod, Gail. Hey, thank you so much. Great to be here. Fantastic. Well, I, I'm experiencing a little bit of a connection issue, but hopefully uh, this this will not uh, persist. Uh, Gail, one of the very special things that you know I love about your background is that you are you know a marketer uh, for recent part of your career, but you've kind of started in the general management. You are a general manager now. And, you know, you, you care about employee experience as well as just the customer and marketing experience, you know, around marketing content. So tell us a little bit about like, what's the special sauce and kind of how did you, how did you get into the marketing given where that you didn't start out being a marketer uh, as a, as your first career move? Sure. Um, interestingly, um, I've worked in a few glamorous industries, waste, energy, and financial services. So you think, how do you go from those three industries to kind of being incredibly passionate about uh, customer experience and marketing experience? And actually, that is the key theme that runs through each of the industries that I have worked in. Um, industries which never necessarily put the customer at the front and center of what they did and needed to make some changes uh, to start to engage with and create high touch, loyal customer experiences. Um, and I guess my role in that has developed over time. So started off very much in operational roles. So running contact centers, um, running kind of engineered field force, which, you know, you really get to see firsthand in those roles, what the customer interactions are, what, what our employees need to make those exp experiences better and what customers needs and what they um, get upset about and what they're looking for, what their expectations are. So I guess it kind of started off looking after operational functions. And then I moved through a few different roles, um, looked after customer retention in a previous uh, company. And then I started to move into more product development. And I do think product development really is a bit of a mini general manager role. So you are concerned and, and interested in all of the factors that contribute to a great customer outcome, profitability. Um, and that's where I guess I started to get quite interested in both the breadth and depth of, of, um, of business, really. Got it. From that, I took the kind of out of product into more marketing um, specialism. And, I, and I've been doing that for the last, I'd say, kind of five to 10 years. And, and so it sounds like you're, the secret to your success is that you're able to connect the dots to, you know, what the real customer is experiencing. You've been there in the trenches. You're not sitting in some sort of ivory tower, drinking up, you know, thinking up or drinking champagne and thinking big strategy, right? Like you can connect it to the, the, the customer experience how to engage the employees uh, that are delivering that customer experience. And oftentimes they're the touch points, especially in DNG, I would imagine that's critical. Yep. Um, and, you know, and so this, this feels really relevant and maybe let's connect it back to DNG uh, because I, I could, I love what, you know, first of all, that it's such a relevant and that it's a hundred year old brand. Like I think one of the, goals for our you know relatively young startup compared to you is that we we got to think 100 years like what's going to happen so here you are a steward of a 100 year old brand but that's still highly relevant because when it comes to all the appliances that yeah. we have in our home I'm a total nincompoop and uh and not a not a superstar so I you know I could have imagined you would kind of help me save the day and you know keep keep the keep the keep things running in the house when things go wrong. So this is, uh, you know, a lot of trust in that brand, right? A lot of, a lot of responsibility, both in terms of what you actually deliver and then, uh, you know, certainly hundred year brand. Like how do you combine that with innovation and trying new things and staying yeah. current? 
it's such an interesting um, story. Well, I, I certainly think it is. Domestic in general started out, as you say, over 100 years ago, insuring um, cattle and sheep, right? So not long after the Titanic went down, there was this there was a need all of a sudden, right, to have protection and insurance on your livestock. And we mm. started there over in Australia. And um, we have, for a, a, a kind of big and, you know, some might think traditional business have actually been pretty creative. We've pivoted a number of times in terms of the core, the core of our business is about providing solutions, protection, insurance. Um, but we have done that on different things over that hundred year history. And certainly in the last kind of 20, 30 years, we've we've really doubled down and specialized in appliances and consumer electronics. And I guess we're quite different to insurance in some respects, in that um we don't care just about um, accepting a claim and settling a claim, really what we want to do is put ourselves right at the centre of that moment of truth around mm. something broken down, your washing machine is pouring water over the floor, how do we yeah. get out to make sure that customer gets the solution that they need as quickly as possible and get them back up and running? So, you know, we are um, very much focused on how do we have experiences that are meaningful um, and I guess I guess one of the other things which has changed a lot in the insurance sector, certainly, is, I don't know, go back a few decades, much of the insurance industry was based on you have a you have some sort of a policy and actually it was somewhat beneficial to companies that you didn't claim. So they were not looking for that high touch interaction with customers. Right. So it's like you buy something and then forget it and hopefully resubscribe oh, yeah. again. Your home insurance, hopefully you'll yeah. never have to make a claim. Yeah. So we think very differently, actually. And, and one of the things that we have launched in kind of recent years is a more of a subscription protection, you know, pay as you go, you're covered um, for as long as you ha have a policy. And that is quite a high touch, high engagement um kind of insurance plan and and for us that's quite important to us because we really want customers to get great value out of our products but we also want to create really positive experiences around it and what we find with those subscription customers is they tend to protect other things in their home so the next kind of looking at is how do you make it super easy for customers to protect all the things that they that, that are important to them essentially and, and, you know, maybe you could, with, without providing individual data, obviously, maybe you have some amazing view as a as a data-driven marketer. And I, I, I know your background is, is very, you know, you're not shy away from that at all. So you're, you have this insight of what do people care about, right? And I think um, home is such a private place to some degree. And maybe you're forcing sometimes the decision of like, what do I, what's really important? What's really essential? To my life do you, what 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 can you tell us about human nature in yeah. 2023 you know what? versus maybe the past uh, you know and then you mentioned electronic devices right recently yep. since you know they weren't around in the kettle kettle yeah. times right like what what do we what do we people you know why do we go to you you know and where those moments of truth really shine where you know people yeah. are like oh my god dale this thing you saved me that was nice but yeah Gail, this 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 really is like you yeah. saved our livelihood right like you saved yeah. our family like what, could tell us about that sure it's um so like i guess just your your point on how does consumer behavior how's consumer behavior in 2023 versus before well i tell you it's changed a heck of a lot in the last two years so with covid lots mm -hmm. of people moved to working from home Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have stayed working from home. Certainly domestic in general, we operate a kind of everyday flexibility um, approach to work. So we have many of our employees at home. And when you're at home, your appliances become even more paramount, right? You're making home, you're storing more food at home, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, people are pretty reliant on their household appliances and therefore expectations around getting them back up and running quickly is, is really important. Um, thinking about customers, though, and, and you were saying you know, what really matters to them, it's very interesting. We're a, a I'd call us a B2B2C brand. So mm -hmm. we're actually 
Um, in many cases, white labelling through huge manufacturers and retailers that are household names that, you know, everyone would know about, whether that's Bosch, Mila, World, Lewis, Argos. There are many brands that we are offering um, protection plans through. Wow. And actually, the customer demographics by by the nature of the brands that we work with are quite different. So, you know, um, we have different demographics for one retailer versus another retailer because they shop for different things or they are interested in different brands. So we do have a very interesting kind of, uh, I'd say, range of customers. And so for us, that makes it even more important to be offering something that is relevant to them and of interest to them. And so we are constantly investing in um, data-driven marketing and mm -hmm. data science and how we understand customers at an individual level rather than a segmented level. And we mm -hmm. are we are talking to those people at the right time, event-driven, experience-driven, to make sure it offers over to them, I guess, that, that makes sense to them and meet their needs. Right. And so it has to be by brand and by their audience specific. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, if I'm buying a really premium device, you know, one set of expectations uh, mm -hmm. versus a low. Uh, so on that note, so obviously, you know, you're a publicly listed company uh, and you have. No, nope. We're, we're, we're private equity owned company, right, private equity owned. So is that is that yep. a recent change? Has it always been? We haven't always been, but for the yeah. last 10, 10 uh, maybe 15, 15 or so years, yeah. we've been private equity owned. And you have, but you have debt in the capital, you have, you must have debt in the capital market. Yes. Sorry, that's, that's the confusion. So you're, you have some, so you, so you still have some, you know, demanding owners you have, you, you have, uh, and, and, you know, I think the connection point is that you have these, what I imagine very large contracts, mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I find really fascinating about B2B to C business is that you have to have this, you know, really, in, you know, amazing kind of consumer grade experience, but then, you know, the, the deal sizes must be very nerve wracking, right? Because losing okay. one contract, you know, uh, you know, or gaining one is a big difference yeah. in um, um, for their organization. So how do you as a marketer, balance out those two and then you know maybe you know for the, for those folks that are more on the b2b side of the spectrum doing big deals what is it that you're doing um bringing that data driven another yeah. approach into that world that, yeah. that helps your teams i think one of the the kind of coolest and most enjoyable things about being in marketing in this particular business is that the marketing team sits right in between the kind of partner uh, or client that we you know, contracting with and the customer. And so it's our job to understand what customers' needs are, build propositions around about that, build marketing experiences around about that, and almost take that to via our client teams uh, to talk to clients about what customers need, how we can service them, mm -hmm. and how we can deliver great value. And almost we become the glue between the customer and, and the um and, and the client. And like I mean, just thinking of a, a completely random example, mm -hmm. but we we really prioritize um, and champion what we call first time resolution. So if an appliance breaks down, for us, the one of the most important metrics is that when we, we send an engineer out, so let's say like manufacturer A um, sends an engineer out, we want that appliance to be fixed first time and our first time kind of fix rate as we call it is 75 percent which is unparalleled in, in the industry because we're sending that manufacturer engineer out to the branded appliance mm -hmm. and to try and improve that um stat um we actually spent some time with the manufacturers engineers themselves so thinking about the engineer experience right what does a day look like for them what barriers or what challenges do they face with customers when they're going to try and repair something? And what kind of solutions or propositions could we help to develop purely focused on that engineer experience to try and make that better? And I think learnings from, from that and, and, and kind of in a previous life, if you get engineers or technicians like really bought in and on board and try to solve some of their problems and their needs, it just has this, you know, great kind of 
throughput into the customer yeah. and then the yeah. employees and, and what have you. So, um, yeah, I think that's the kind of role that marketing can play in between the, the, the client and the customer. We become, you know, quite valuable for a number of reasons and help therefore kind of extend and, and prolong the life of those, those client contracts. Got it. So I think it's really like, again, back to that original aha of like, if you can, the, if, if you're not touching as a marketing organization, you're not touching the customer yourself, you better work incredibly hard to create wonderful experiences for the people who do touch them so they can focus on the customer and not, you know, solving yeah. technical things. Uh, ab like absolutely. And, and we're, I guess, the role that we play is we are being white labeled, we are creating those brand experiences so, you know, if a manufacturer um, sells an appliance through a retailer, because they don't sell them direct, generally, yeah. they say, you go into a store, you buy an appliance manufacturer A, then we will be the, the, the kind of the initial branded experience for that, that um, mm -hmm. customer. And we immediately start to create, um, I guess, just um, an interaction, start to build a little bit of... Um, I guess, engagement with the customer for that brand. So the way that we talk to our partners is about creating actual brand experiences right, that they then mm -hmm. create loyalty and, 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 you know, when that appliance comes to the end of its life, we'll replace it with a new manufacturer, a brand. So you have this kind of cradle to grave cycle. Got it. So, um, so really you're an extension uh, for those, for those teams in, in, sure. in the way that they think about the world. And and so this this is interesting, right? These are global brands, where some of them are UK centric, but generally global. Um, and you're in twelve uh, geographies. Mm -hmm. uh, you run one of those, uh, yeah. the US, as you could hear from my accent, one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but w tell us, tell us about kind of supporting that that geographic range. Is it that the customers that are pulling you into the new markets? Were you there already? And you know they. They came to you because you were able to support provide this global footprint. You yeah, know, it's really um, interesting. So um, it was a couple a couple of years ago now. Um, we have always found, like I'm sure many businesses, the US to be a super interesting marketplace. Mm -hmm. Right, huge economy, um, huge footprint, and huge you know households, all of which are very interested in protecting um stuff in their house insurance um there's a strong kind of appeal and, and positive sentiment to covering items and protecting devices and appliances and such like so it felt for for a number of reasons a very interesting market for us to to enter um one of our partners whirlpool um who um head who are headquartered in the us we've worked with them in the uk and continental europe for over 30 years felt like a really good um, fit. So we, through the relationships that we've got in Europe and the UK, um, we started to work together with them on a, a potential opportunity to move there and agreed some exclusivity to move out to the US and start to build a program that, that met their needs and their business strategy. So we've been doing that with them for about 18 months now, um, live in some channels and, and extending to, to some more channels. It's just been a it's been a great experience overall for for me on a personal level, uh, starting mm. to learn about some of the customer nuances, some of the client nuances, cultural employee nuances, um. But overall, it's just been it's been great. It's kind of like having a start up, um, but with the backing of a business that's you know the market leader in the UK, and and that's. You know, for me, a winning combination. I feel hugely supported by the business. It's, it's an important strategic priority for us. But we've got this um, kind of nice startup feel to it, where we're yeah. you know we're on employee number. Uh, well, we were on employee number twenty three. We've just acquired another business out there, so we've added another hundred and twenty five, and we're kind of starting to grow and and spread our wings, and it's it's great. So what? How are you changing your approach in your day to day job, where you have a you know three thousand employees mm -hmm. and lots of these amazing brands who you represent? Uh, but now you're you're effectively a startup founder, at least in the U.S. market, right? Yeah. Was just one anchor customer, so it's not like you, you still got a ways to go. Um, 
how is how is being in the startup world that's you know that's near and dear a little bit to us how is that changing how you're running the rest of the uh, of the business yeah so so i guess a couple of thoughts um i have got an amazing team so the marketing team at domestic in general are brilliant and is a very collaborative business actually and um, when you kind of stretch across functions the team here are going to be just fine and they the um you know, I'm there when when they need me, but they don't need me so much anymore is what I would say. Um, in terms of how to approach a startup, about, I think maybe 10 or so years ago, um, when I worked at British Gas, a uh, previous uh, business, I had the opportunity to um, start the, the Connected Homes division in British mm. Gas. And it was tiny back then. And you might have heard of Hive, the remote heating control mm -hmm. thermostat. So that was my baby. And um, essentially me and a team of five kind of kicked that initiative off back in the day at British Gas. And within a few years of hard graft, it, you know, it's now a, a, a kind of mainstream technology product with its own brand. And who knows what kind of million pounds PL it's running in its own right. But um, so I very much enjoy and have had some experience in that kind of um, you know the green shoots and the mm -hmm. the kind of early Inter days of rolling up your sleeves, yeah. doing a bit of everything. Yeah, that's great. So you you're really like kind of coming back to the beginning of the conversation about your mix of your careers. You're kind of a generalist, right? And then you you but that you're running such a you know a successful and now independently successful without even your help marketing team. You know a lot of people who are starting out um, or maybe they are the CEO and they need to kind of run a marketing, you know, be more influential in the way the the marketing uh, strategy is run across organizations. Like they're like, they're wondering, you know, I'm busy, you know, what, what, what are the inspirations areas to learn? Like where are the good go-to resources that you used? Maybe if, if I wonder if anything still inspires you or you kind of recommend to your team, you know, yeah. given that, that that's sort of typically not uh, some people just grow up and just keep consuming marketing, marketing yeah. content, which is, you know, as you know, very specialized across different disciplines. You had you had a bit of a jump. Right. So how did you manage that? Um, yeah, in your context? I, think I, I don't have a, a very clever or, you know, unique answer for that. I would say I think kind of as I've gone through my career, um, I'm very curious and I love to learn and I spend, you know, a lot of my time out of my comfort zone. And so if you can, if you can kind of embrace some of that, it helps. Um, the key for me is having good people around about you um, and how you kind of understand who's good, what skills you need. Make sure you recruit people that don't look and kind of um, behave or have the same experience as yourself, right? Because... Okay. That doesn't get you. That doesn't really get you anywhere if you're you're surrounded by lots of people that that are similar to you. Um, and I think being very like for me, it's just about being very open and honest. Um, and when I don't know a subject matter, I'm gonna listen, um, and I'm gonna say that I'm not an expert in this space, and I kind of would like some help or I need some experts to to kind of help help us as a team kind of progress in that journey. And I've always, I've always found that, you know, success breeds success. And when um, you're surrounded by good people and you're empowering them and giving them their chance to shine, mm -hmm. you know, they, they will do. And, and that elevates kind of everyone in the team. So yeah, there's no like kind of new news there, I'm sure, but, but they're the things that I kind of tend to, to think about and prioritize um, when I'm moving into something new. Something you well, one of the things on the marketing side that you know I saw that you worked on is kind of reimagining the customer charter, which I'm sure is interesting in a hundred year old yeah. organization. <laughs> and then I also saw you you recently kind of had a more of a cultural blueprint work, where one phrase in particular really resonated with with us as well: make the world a better place, one repair at a time. Um, for 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 me and my tiny world like we have a phrase of like um you know change change the world one document at a time you know so yeah. like, so but it's sort of the same thing about like uh interactions repair 
uh, some kind. So you've you've clearly thought through, and you you know, as a marketer, I'm sure you've you've yeah. helped shape that organization wide process. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you how do yeah. you drive this sort of change and innovation in the in the large organization? Got it. Yeah, I think that um, just just picking up first of all on the kind of make the world a better place one repair at a time. I think our business model is very symbiotic with the sustainability chat like challenge that we all have, right? Mm. And I think that businesses can be a force for good as well as good business, if that makes sense. And so for us, we're in eight, eight, about 8,000 homes every single day repairing stuff. And if mm. we can repair and extend the life of appliances, we're at the moment in the UK alone, we're kind of preventing over 2 million appliances going to landfill, right? So we genuinely think that we are having an impact on, on that um, kind of carbon impact, circular economy. And so that's quite important to us. Uh, and it's not manufactured, right? This isn't a manufactured story. It's like a real, this is essentially what we exist to do, repair appliances, right. keep them working longer. And then when you start to kind of listen to employees, whether it's attracting new employees, retaining employees, um, people want to work for a purpose-led business, right? And, you know, warranty or insurance might not have that same appeal, like until you kind of scratch a little bit on yeah. the surface and then you find out actually there's there's some interesting themes here and mm -hmm. there's some good that we can do um so for me kind of I guess how we approach that whole process and and we're currently kind of going back through a bit of a brand strategy exercise is to engage people um, employ all audiences, employees, customers, partners, investors, like it's really important to kind of listen to people, understand what they think, what should we stand for, what should we stand against, what drives and motivates them. The difficult bit is trying to get one, like one golden theme because people have lots of different views and opinions, but we certainly engage people and we try to create advocates. So right now, um, some of the brand work that we're doing, we're actually going to be pulling together a group of brand advocates to then help kind of create the message and I guess embody the message, drive the message, share the message. So, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm one thing I'm confident about as, as we wrap up this, this, uh, this half hour is that um, the future of hundred year old brand is in safe hands with you, Gail. This is really uh, you. you know, amazing to see the energy, the openness to new ideas, the broad range of skill sets that, that you're bringing in. And I think um, hopefully you challenge the general managers to be better at thinking about customer experiences and really owning it and vice versa, helping CMOs everywhere to think a lot more like a general manager and how do they create a holistic, interconnected uh, journey for the customer. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been fun. No, it's been great. Thanks so much. Great to meet you.